I'm actually going to start out with a story, and I haven't told you two this story. Okay. Um, it's about my story of data and what works and what doesn't. I lit my parents' car on fire when I was five years old. Oh, okay. Okay? Aggressive start. Um, this is true. This is a true story. They owned a 78 Mercury. This is in the 80s. Yes, I'm dating myself a little bit. And my parents owned a shop. And in this plaza, there was a paper store. And in the old days, there was cigarette lighters in these cars. And you would push them in. You remember? And they'd pop out. And they had coils. And you would see those coils be really orange, almost red. And that's how you'd light your cigarette back in the day in the car. Glad we don't do that anymore. So I thought to myself, I was a pretty inquisitive five-year-old, which paper would burn faster? So I took the change out of the ashtray, I went in the paper store, and I bought cardstock, and I bought paper mache. Well, I should have started with the cardstock. I didn't. I pushed in the cigarette lighter, popped it out, took the paper mache, touched. And I was five, so I dropped it. I remember running into my parents' store and looking in the car and flames in the middle of the seat. <laughs> my dad running for a fire extinguisher yelling, what the hell did you just do? And that was it. So that's when I started my passion for testing with data, is lighting my parents' car on fire. So it's led me here today to Vid Summit. So, so anybody want me to ride in their car tonight? I need a ride, no. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start off. Um, I always like having a good little story, a little icebreaker, but what inspired you to create, Hunter? Um, so I started making videos when I was a little kid, when the iPod came out, the camera, I'm sure the older people who remember that, when the iPod had the camera. I was making stop motion videos of Legos when I was a kid, because you know, I'm a kid, Legos. And then I started getting the Call of Duty more, and I remember watching all these YouTubers upload their gameplays. So Al Ye is what initially got me into it, like 2011, 2012. And then from there, I got inspired by more real life creators and really paved my path to make my own unique content. I love everything about like editing, storytelling, going out and shooting videos, everything like that. So mainly got inspiration from other creators. Okay, what about you, Kev? Um, when I was in uh, high school, I used to wanna I uh, worked for ESPN and edit like those sports highlight videos like before the, the finals of a sports game and they show like the year in review. So that's how I wanted to like, that's the first thing I wanted to do is just make those videos. And I think in that process, I just fell in love with just making a video and I've just been doing it ever since. Okay, thank you, thank you. We're gonna start firing off, okay? We're gonna start to get into these questions that you guys, or these topics that you want to. So. Now you know a little bit about us. You know that I like to burn cars on fire. Yeah. You like to do similar things in your videos too. But in a less destructive way. Yeah, less destructive way. No, you're just pretty destructive. <laughs> Not as destructive as him, lighting the car on fire. Um, so here's the question. When you're looking at your content or videos, do you look at the data and analytics, then decide which tools or strategies to leverage, or do you like using a tool to help drive that decision making? For me, I look at videos that perform really well and really bad. I don't usually look at the ones that perform okay because they're just performing okay. Can't really get much from that because they're a little wavy, but I look at videos that perform super bad. I look at drop-offs. I look at the subject as a whole, if it, if it was even worth it. And then for videos that do really well, I look at the patterns of when people are staying, when people are dropping off for even just a couple of seconds and then coming back. And I look at CTR because CTR is super important. So I look at CTR data. I actually use TubeBuddy for making thumbnails and helping me deciding the data of like, okay, where are people gonna look on the thumbnail? Are you gonna look at the bottom right because there's too much color? Is there too much going on where the whole thing's gonna be lit up? I use AI for that kind of stuff. Okay, is there any other tools besides TubeBuddy? Um, no. Good answer. <laughs> we did not pay him to say that, by the way. <laughs> I was not paid, no. <laughs> Kevin, what about you? Um, I think both. I've, um, I, I, the data kind of is used to steer the ship a little bit in terms of, you know, I'll post a video and then based on, it's a good mix of, because when you already have a, kind of a fan base, you want to make content for that fan base, but also for a new audience. And so my video in the first few weeks is kind of watched by fans, and that gives me data on what my fans like, but not necessarily what the masses like. 
And so after a few weeks, I can go in and see, like, what is my actual CTR? Like, my CTR in the first few days is going to be higher because obviously it's the people who already watch me and love me. And once that wears off, like, I think that's where the true data comes in, mm -hmm. in terms of, like, someone who doesn't know me. And are they clicking on my video? And that's the data I kind of take, and I'm able to, like, maybe change my thumbnails, change my titles, and make them more appealing to a wider audience. Uh, you mentioned something earlier to me, um, and if you want to talk about it here, you can. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, obviously. Uh, tell me a little about your audience shift in the past year. Um, yeah. Uh, my, my audience has changed a lot. It was, uh, I think, 94% female in December. That's um, obvious why, right, everybody? Uh, <laughs> Woo. No, I, 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 I love women, all women. <laughs> Uh, now it's like 60, 40. Uh, there's, the homies are arriving, as I like to, as I've been saying, the homies are here. So that's been a big shift. And so I've been battling how do I keep my old audience happy while still making content for this new audience? And a lot of it, I mean, I hate to, to be that guy, but too, buddy. <laughs> Did not pay him either. <laughs> it's helpful because I'm able to use the tools on there to like, navigate that battle of making content for the audience and using the data and the information I'm learning to help me pick and choose my decisions, you know? So how do you leverage the AI and content creation process, right? Yeah, um, well, there's a lot of tools you can use. I, I, know, I know TubeBuddy has the title generator, which is nice. I think it's hard for me to just go into this AI software and be like, shoot me out 10 titles, because I'm not, I'm not trying to make the most viral videos every week. That's not really what I want to do. I want to make videos that resonate with me and the people that like, I want to watch. Like, I'm not trying to make a video for everybody. I'm trying to make a video for a, a certain demo. And I want to make sure I stay true to that demo. So if I was a basketball influencer, I want to make sure I make basketball videos and not just titles and thumbnails that anybody can watch. And so I'll use, I'll come up with my own titles and then use the title generation, generation tool to give me similar titles to that one so I can get ideas on how I can adjust that title. Um, A-B testing on TubeBuddy is also really good in terms of figuring out which thumbnails hit. And then uh, the short form content, which we'll get into that later. I'll let Hunter jump in on this though. Um, when it comes to using AI tools, there's another one I use. It's not TubeBuddy, uh, I use ChatGPT. So first off, when I think of AI, when you make videos, you have to be careful. You can't be too destructive with it because then it feels like you're watching a robot, right? Um, one thing I do that I think a lot of people could take from this is I use AI, uh, specifically ChatGPT, I use, use it to shorten scripts I've already created because then you can get your point across still, but in a very flowy way where you're not ranting too much or you're saying useless words, right? So I'll type in my script and I'll say shorten this and it gives me a much, much better version of something I already made. So I think a lot of you could take away from that easily. And another thing too is um, for a lot of younger people and adults, the preferred reading level is eighth grade, which is weird. But you know, if you type in shorten this script or make it sound like an eighth grade reading level, that can really, really help you a lot. I've been using it recently. Um, I wasn't using it in previous videos, but I just started using it in recent videos and I saw a huge change in my retention from that. You, you heard it here. Um, how do you stay up to date on like which tools and trends to use? with AI, data, et cetera. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go? Um, I use TikTok a lot. I don't use, I don't make TikTok, because I'm a mainly a YouTuber. I like to focus on that platform, because that's what I'm good at. But I think TikTok's really good for keeping up to date on what's new and what's trending, for sure. So you don't, you don't make a ton of TikTok content, but you consume it. I will navigate it for resourceful purposes that help me with YouTube. Which, which, hashtags, which hashtags do they need to search to find this? Um, you could just search up hashtag AI tools. You don't even have to put a hashtag. You can just look up AI tools for video creation because TikTok has a really great search engineering system, I feel like. Okay. I'm going to start doing that. People ask me why y'all is on TikTok. I'm going to say I'm just navigating the market to figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I consume a lot of just content. Same. Whether it's – mine's a lot of it is on YouTube, but I just – like I'm in the car and I'm just listening to – Frickin' Khan and Samir, you know, like, I'm consuming. If I'm not working on my content, I am consuming, and I call it market research as a joke, but, like, I'm just watching what everybody's doing 
all the time. How people are moving, how they're adapting. If I'm, you know, the creator, I'm just like, I don't care if you have two subs or two billion subs, I wanna know what you're doing, how you're doing it, and I'm just trying to learn from everybody and taking in what works for me. Um, Isn't that the true definition of an artist, right? Stealing guess, pieces yeah. from everybody, yeah, yeah. right? Thank you for this. I appreciate this clap that. There. Yeah, yeah. It just made my heart low for uh, it. Which, which platforms do you find most effective to create content? I'm, I'm kind of going back, right? But like, which platforms do you like to create content on and why? Um, mainly YouTube, just because you can really break down how to make a video do super well. TikTok, I think, is really good as well, but not for getting paid, obviously. But it's good to bring your traffic over. But how I see it is you should leave platforms. You should leave viewers on certain platforms because people go to TikTok to consume short form, right? If you're making long form on YouTube, that might not convert well for people. But I think YouTube, X or Twitter, whatever you call it, it's pretty good. And then TikTok, I think those are the main super good ones. Yeah, it's funny. I, I had this combo with my, my best friend, Arya, who's one of the most smartest people on the planet ever. He's right here, by uh, the way. The other day. Shout him out. <laughs> <laughs> and we, <laughs> we were talking about how you don't upload a TikTok to Spotify, right? Like, you, you, you don't do that. You upload songs to Spotify. So don't upload a YouTube video to TikTok. And it's this idea that, like, my favorite kind of content to make is YouTube, but I can't spend my time cutting those videos and placing them on these other platforms, trying to convince people to come over to YouTube. It's hard enough to get people to just like something, let alone leave an app, open another app. Yeah, it's just too much work. So when you're making content for these platforms, just make it for the platform. Don't worry so much about how can I get you over to this other platform. Just grow your TikTok with TikToks, grow your YouTube with YouTube, grow your your Twitter with tweets, like, just adjust, take, take a piece of content, and while you're making that piece of content, ask yourself, how many TikToks can I make out of this? How many uh, reels can I make out of this? Not necessarily, like, once the video's done, how can I promote this across all these platforms? Because it's a, it's a hard, long road trying to get people to switch from platforms to platforms versus just organically keeping them on the platform and liking you on that platform. And here's my shameless plug. We do have an AI shortener tool, by the way, for TubeBuddy, so you should check that one out. Um, can help on that. But I'm going to dive into, Kevin, a little bit of what you're saying. You should take this man's advice because... With a grain of salt. Creating for the platform itself, right? Not worrying about what's happening on other ones and just doubling down. Can you tell the audience how many followers you've gained on TikTok over the past month? A, 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 a very, an amount I'm very happy with, but it's not about that. <laughs> it's he's, it's he's, more because I, I stopped trying to make, I, I was so focused on finding the best moments from the videos and trying to get you to come over to YouTube, and I just stopped doing that. I just started to take the videos and being like, what are some awesome TikToks we can make in this? Because I noticed that my TikTok was very inconsistent. You know, it was ranging from 10,000 views to a million views like next to each other. And I know the pattern I noticed was that um, if the TikTok doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end, as in if you feel like you're not in on the joke, you, it's a moment from another video and therefore you're not, you're, you, you need the rest of the story. That's where the viewership kind of dropped. And so I started to really watch my TikToks and my short form content overall and ask myself, can this live by itself? Is this something that like, if I watch from start to finish, I can get hooked at the beginning, enjoy what I'm watching, get that result at the end and be fulfilled, not needing to see anything else, but maybe curious about what else is out there. And once I made that switch, um, we started getting hundreds of millions of views. <laughs> He's being shy. He, he, he's grown hundreds of thousands over the past month with this strategy, so. It could be luck. <laughs> Just make that I clear. doubt it. So how do you, okay, how do you balance then, obviously there's a lot of discussion in AI and the impact it has on a personal brand, the authenticity, right? How do you balance a personal brand with AI and the platform itself? I personally believe you should not use AI. Okay, it uh, depends on the content you're making. If you're making 
let's say, a video about the, a president, I feel like it's okay to use AI in that degree because you're using history, and if you did like a voice over the AI, I think that's okay, but when it comes to making, let's say, gaming content or lifestyle content, I think using AI can be very destructive because then you lose that personal feel and you lose like that touch of the heart of like connecting to the creator, but I believe using AI tools to help you with your workflow is super important and super good. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and, and Jimmy touched on this earlier, but I think you should be using AI to improve your workflow. Like, you should still be coming up with your own ideas, adding your own touch, and then using the tools that AI has. Instead of spending an hour coming up with title ideas, like plug that thing in the AI TubeBuddy system and just get those titles and then use those to shorten your hours. Um, but I think we have, there's still a little bit of work left to be done. I, I was just telling Cam earlier, I think the future, hopefully, with AI is, you know, we film a video, AI kind of edits it in terms of like, you know, switching between camera angles based on who's talking. We like those AI podcast editing programs. So it shoots it right in the frame, which is an editing software where you give notes on. And you can just give it notes like punch in here, cut out this part, use an upbeat music here, song here. And then AI can just go in and do those notes for you. And then you have a final watch and then the video comes out. I think that's when AI will become a tool that, again, still serves as fastening your workflow, but will be really useful. So an augmentation of your personal brand, but on steroids, basically. I guess, yeah. I yeah. feel like editors listening to me now are shaking in their boots. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see how much time. There's a big speaker in front of me, so. Um, okay, so can you tell us a couple lessons you've learned from collaborating with brands. We had a brand deal shout out here. Can you tell us a couple lessons you've learned with working with brands uh, and data you use or the approaches you use for brand deals or collaborating with other content creators? Uh, yeah, I'll start with the uh, collabing with content creators. So when it comes to collabing, I truly believe that collabs are not hard to get if all of your content speaks very highly of you, because then it's easy for somebody to be like, okay, like all this content's good, and we can collab, there's no problems, because um, me personally, I've done a lot of collabs um, with other creators, and it was very easy, because they know my content represents high value, so that's how I do it, and then with brand deals, always get brand deals done on time, because you don't want to destroy relationships, it's a huge one, and when it comes to brand deals, you can reach out and be like, hey, I'm doing this kind of video, and it'll fit in perfectly, so an example for me, I did a brand integration with this company called Factor, and it's one of these things where they deliver fresh food to your house, you just heat it up, you're good to go. And how I integrated it, um, I, I did a Call of Duty video about like playing the game a lot, and like, you get this special thing in the game, and I told Factor, I was like, hey, we can integrate the food thing, I can talk about, oh, if you don't wanna get up from your gaming, you can order Factor. And the video has over 2.5 million views now because I integrated it so well. And uh, with brand deals, there will be drop-offs. Like people will skip it and then come back. You'll see that drop-off. With the integration I did, it was barely a drop-off. It was like two percent, and they came back. So with brand integrations, you really need to make it related to the content. If you don't want people to just skip past it, because that'll hurt the retention overall, which will get your video less appeal. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think with other creators, I would try to really make sure there's a value exchange. I think a lot of uh, even me, when I was coming up, I wanted to collaborate with creators, and it was just one of those, like, oh, like, let's do videos together, but at the end of the day, it's like, how can I help you? How can you help me? You know, for me right now, it's I'm in a position where um, the videos are getting a good amount of traction, so it's easy for me to go out to a creator. Maybe it's, you know, maybe I want Hunter to come on, and he's about to release, I don't know, a, a game or something. I can say, hey, you want to promote your game, I'm getting good traction, come on the show, and let's talk about your game and also get you to bring your fan base over. Clear value exchange versus like, I have nothing to offer you, we're getting no views, just come on and be in my video. That relationship is not gonna last, right? So always ask yourself, no matter how many followers you have, what's something you can bring to the table? And we've seen creators like, you know, uh, Eric, who with the Logan Paul Couch series, like, He's giving Logan content, you know. When you look at those big creators, ask yourself, what's something that, like, you've heard them say that, like, they're trying to do or they're missing or they're, 
they, they, they're trying to make happen, can you do that for them while creating content for yourself? And then for brands, I'll be super fast. Um, make sure the brand works with your brand. <laughs> I love what you said, though, Kev, because it's about, it's like a normal relationship in life, right? Yeah. If you go into it saying, I'm going to... I'm going to give you this as true value, and I don't expect anything in return, and that same person has that, then it becomes sure. impactful, right? So that's good tips. Uh, okay, so I think we're running out. I want to leave a little time for Q&A. So the last question, what advice do you have for aspiring content creators looking to build a personal brand today? Um, my advice is don't give up and build your experience, because for me, it wasn't just it happened overnight, it took years and years of experience. And with years of experience, you learn new technology, like editing softwares, you know, Photoshop, you learn storytelling, you overall learn how to make videos and how things work a lot better when you have a bunch of data because you've been doing a bunch of things. Like I've been making content forever and it only kicked off in 2019. So just focus on getting better and better. If you look at big artists like Kanye West or Drake, they can make a hit on the spot because they have all that experience built. So just never give up and constantly work hard at improving yourself and your knowledge. Um, this might be a controversial uh, statement, but don't focus on making viral video as much as focus on building your brand. Like, don't try to make every video viral because then you just become known for making viral video and the second you stop doing that, no one's gonna watch you. Versus if you like baking cakes, like, Girls just bake cakes and <laughs> inject viral ideas into baking cakes. Like create, package your video with titles and thumbnails and build retention hacks in your video around building and making cakes so that as trends of virality come and go, you are still known as the person who makes cakes. You know what I'm saying? Like if you are constantly chasing what's the highs of social media, when those go back down, so will you. So just think about something that you'd be willing to do for 10 years, and you'll, you'll be happy doing it regardless of what it is, and then turn that into a viral idea. Because then when you get to that place where you no longer want to do the thing that everybody else is doing, and you switch, you'll be fighting that battle of like transitioning those fans over versus having a fan base built around something that you already love making. And I have one more thing to touch on with that. Also, evolving is important. Um, just a few years ago when I started blowing up, I was just making Call of Duty gameplay, funny stuff, and now my videos evolved from Call of Duty to a little bit of Call of Duty, but like shooting guns and blowing stuff up, and people still love it because I evolved the content. So also just evolve a lot. Well, this was really good advice. <laughs> uh, I hope that you all grab something out of this. Um, you two are amazing content creators, and let's give it up for Kev and Hunter TV. Thank you. Uh, and, and their tips today. Uh, we have a few minutes for Q&A. So, yeah, let's do a little Q&A. Do we have a mic to pass or should we? Okay, awesome, thank you. Hi. So, I, you guys said this, other people have been saying this, data, data, data. Is there any way to be successful without reading the goddamn data? <laughs> No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, no. I mean, you, it's, it's sure, but it's, it's hard. It, it, it'd be like being in a Formula One driver and you only are a good driver, but you don't study the car, the mechanics. Like, it, you can be good, but you're not going to be great. Got it. Cool. Thanks. What's up? Thanks, guys. Um, I'm a Christian content creator, and I never would have imagined this when I first started, but the audience that I've cultivated is very different than what I would have expected as a creator. So mainly, I'm dealing with like 55 to 75-year-old women. That's my main, my main demographic. That's so it's, hard. It's good CPMs right there. It's an yeah. it, it, I'm like a financial channel. It's amazing. It's awesome. I need you up here right CPM, now. CPM, RPM-wise, I'm really, really happy. But I was wondering, from your point of view, having a female audience, something that obviously maybe you don't have as much intuition naturally about, how would you how would you go about uh, serving an audience that you don't necessarily resonate with personally? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Because when when I had that ninety five percent, it's tough. One, there is, um, 
I'll never know what it's like to, to be a woman, obviously. So there's a lot of things I can't speak to, a lot of brands I can't work with. Thankfully, I have an amazing sister, an amazing mother, an amazing fiance. So like, I surround myself with women. And I tried at, the, at that time to have as many women work with me as possible to kind of watch what I'm making, give me their input so that I can get a, a woman's touch on it because for the things that I could miss. That, that to me was super helpful. All right, we got a last question back here. Yes, thank you. Um, are there any tools in particular that really impressed you and improved your workflow as far as AI? Uh, again, I said it earlier, ChatGBT for scripts helps so much because it cuts the video down from just yapping to getting the important points across. So that overall gives you better retention. I would say ChatGBT for sure, for scripts. I, I got to go with TubeBuddy, to be honest with you. I've been using TubeBuddy since before I knew the TubeBuddy team. So I feel like it's always been helpful from the early days of like picking hashtags for me, nigh down to like the AI software they're building whether it's A-B testing, title generation, or even down to suggested shorts, you know, I'm able to go into my retention and kind of see the spikes and the moments that could be turned into shorts. But if you're not constantly looking at data, you might miss that. And having that tool can literally tell you like, hey, this part of your video is getting a lot of attention. You should cut that into a short. So that, to me, that's been super helpful. All right, give it up for Cam. Thank Hunter you. TV and Kevin. Thank you.